Welcome. 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 Welcome to the unlikely. To the unlikely. To the unlikely seminarian. Welcome to the unlikely seminarian. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Unlikely Seminarian Podcast. I am your host, Dan Cook, and once again, thank you for taking the time to listen. Glad to have you still with me. Sorry, it's been a little bit since the lab's podcast, but had a couple of weeks off in between summer classes and fall classes, so I decided to take a brief break from podcasting. But fall classes are back in full swing, and there's plenty of seminary topics to talk about, and I look forward to discussing them with you as we go along. Again, uh, feedback always welcome and encouraged, and you can reach me at unlikelyseminarian at gmail.com, unlikelyseminarian at gmail.com. Feel free to email at any time. I do read them all and will reply to as many as possible. I'd also like to offer a quick apology for the recording that you're about to hear. Uh, as some of you know, I tape these in my apartment and happened to have the windows open today and thought I had the mic level down enough. I built myself sort of a little sound screen here. Uh, and it turned out the world's longest either garbage or recycling pickup was going on outside the apartment uh, through most of the recording. So you're going to hear a very, rather large truck engine rumbling in the background. You're going to hear uh, the backup beep going in seemingly incessantly. And I apologize for that. Uh, it just is uh, the nature of, of the area with which I've chosen to do this recording. So please bear with me and hang in there. Hopefully the content's good enough to justify the background noise. Let's get to the podcast. So I threatened to do this episode a little while ago. I had a few people that sounded interested in it. So let's talk Bible translations today. The first and most obvious question is, why are there so many translations of the Bible? And the answer to that question lies in the very word translation. The Bible, of course, written in its original languages, consisted of Hebrew, uh, some Aramaic, and Greek. And the trick is that none of those three languages translates very directly to what is likely the most dominant language on the planet today, English. So you have a lot of different translations. There are different meanings to phrases, to idioms, to expressions, to individual words in the original biblical language that you could justifiably translate those things into when you take it to English or any other modern language. Hence, people are left to try and take the context of what is being said and come up with what they believe is the best translation of any given piece of text. And human beings being what they are, imperfect and such, people are going to disagree on how specifically to translate different portions of the Bible. So that's the primary reason you have so many different translations. But it goes a little deeper than that. And this is where I think we really want to get into the meat of this, which is the natural question then is what is the best translation? And that's a fair question. That's a smart question. It just happens to be the wrong question. What do I mean by that? The reason that's the wrong question is the translations aren't really on a spectrum of better or worse. They're on a spectrum of of word-for-word -word translation to thought-for-thought -thought translation. And so the, the question becomes, what are you trying to use a specific translation for? If you're using a specific translation for academic purposes, you probably want to go with more, something more along the lines of word-for-word -word translation. If you're using something for Bible study, for preaching, uh, maybe somewhere in the middle, if you're looking to try and get a basic understanding of a passage, the thought behind a passage, then you want to lean more towards the thought-for-thought thought end of the spectrum. And really, the trick that they teach you in seminary is that you should be reading translations along each point in the spectrum or from different ends of the spectrum. But the point isn't to pick a Bible and say, this is my Bible and this is it and that's all I'm doing. The point is to say, no, take one from a more of a word-for-word -word translation, see what that says, take something that's somewhere in the middle, take something that's more thought-for-thought, -thought. take you know a piece of each of those, see what each has to say, and how one can inform the other. So how does that spectrum work? Well, I, if you go to unlikelyseminarian.com and click on the blog page, I'm going to have a post there that will link you to a graphic uh, from Bible Gateway, which is a website I use quite frequently uh, to look up Bible passages. And I think it does a really, really good job of laying out how this spectrum works or where different translations live along that spectrum. 
and I'll talk to you about a few of my favorites and, and kind of where I end up. But you'll see if you look at this, if you look at this spectrum that you have on the left side, this word for word type translations, right? The NASB lives there. The AMP lives there. Uh, the English Standard Version, the ESV, which is one that I tend to use, lives on that end of the spectrum. Uh, the King James Version lives on that end of the spectrum. And then you get more towards the middle section, which is trying to stay as close to the word-for-word -word translation as possible while getting at the thought of what the author was trying to say. That's kind of right in the middle. And, and the NIV, the New International Version, is the one I sort of gravitate towards there. Start getting towards the thought-for-thought -thought end of the spectrum, and that's the Living Bible leads you in that direction. And kind of on the far end, our translations like the message and the voice, which make no pretense whatsoever to trying to be a literal word-for-word -word translation. They're trying to tell you the story of the Bible. And the actual words that were used aren't necessarily what they're tethered to in that end. And I wouldn't want to live on that end. You know, I think God's revelation in the Bible is important in the words that were chosen to be used. I think the Holy Spirit was intentional in that regard. So I wouldn't want to live on that end. But I do think that those translations provide useful perspective on the story behind the Bible. And then once you get a kind of big picture view of what the story is, and you go back to the word-for-word -word type translations, you get a better idea of what, how important those words are and what those words are really trying to get at. So I think it's important to look at passages from all three parts of the spectrum there, and I think that uh, that graphic will help you quite a bit. Now, one of the things I want to point out, especially on the word-for-word -word end of the spectrum, uh, the English Standard Version and the New Revised Standard Version are two that I really enjoy on that end. I think they do a really nice job to stick as close to possible to the original Greek and Hebrew without losing readability. The English Standard Version has more of a classical feel to it, if you were like me, raised in the Catholic Church, uh, that's going to feel more traditional in that regard. The, the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, is kind of a more modernized version. While still hanging to that word-for-word -word ethic, uh, it's got a more modern feel to it as you read through it. So I like those two from that end of the spectrum. Uh, the King James Version, which lives on that end of the spectrum, one of the problems with the King James Version, and it's obviously a very traditional and well, widely used uh, throughout history Bible. But when the King James Version was translated, uh, there was something on the order of a couple 300 manuscripts that the translators had at their, had uh, available to them in order to make that translation. And a lot of the more modern translations, we now have literally tens of thousands of manuscripts uh, to look at. And of course, when you when you have that much more data to work from, it's a lot easier to find, to kind of hone in on the exact original language. The more and more manuscripts that we come up with, the more manuscripts that are studied, the more manuscripts that are translated, uh, the closer we actually get to the original verbiage of the Bible. There's a fascinating site put together by a group called the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. And I'll put a link to this in that same blog that I talked to you about at unlikelyseminarian.com, uh, where this guy's mission is to digitally photograph in as high resolution as possible, as many of the existent manuscripts of the New Testament as possible, to make them, to put them online and make it a free resource for people to study. Uh, and if you go to that website and you, you know, you're so inclined, just take a look around, not only at some of the photography, which is spectacular in and of itself, but you, when you have them speak about the math of it and how that much more data gets us that much closer to the original, uh, the original language, the original manuscripts themselves it's really fascinating stuff and, it, and i think it's uh it's really encouraging when you're looking at the bible when you hear people like bart ehrman say you know we don't have the originals we don't have copies of the originals we don't have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of the originals and he uses that to dismiss the reliability of the bible i, I mean i understand and, and bart ehrman's a very smart guy i'm not trying to knock him um i just think he gets it wrong in this particular instance. I think when you have as much information as we do, I think we have a very reliable idea of what the very original language was. But again, we have all these translations because that original language, the Hebrew, the Greek, uh, doesn't translate directly. And so that's where you get a lot of the discrepancy there. But that's worth checking out as well. We have so much information uh, to work from when we're doing translations of the Bible. It, it's really, really fascinating. So the point being in that story was that the King James Bible 
didn't have as many manuscripts available to it from which to translate, and therefore I don't think does as good a job translating as some of those other uh, translations that live on that end of the spectrum. So uh, I don't mean to disrespect specifically the King James Version. It just isn't my favorite version of the Bible. And I think there's a lot of people that knock it that don't understand why they knock it. Um, and I think if you're going to take shots at it or if you're going to knock it, it's useful to know why. And I think that's, uh, that's a fairly solid reasoning as to why not to use the King James Version of the Bible. But I think you could say that or you could indicate that for any singular version of the Bible. That's why you don't want to be stuck in one place when it comes to picking versions of the Bible. You want to look through various versions, figure out kind of where they are in that spectrum, and then find you know two or three that work for you. And consistently, as you're doing your Bible study, look at those two or three different versions uh, when you're looking at a particular passage. There's also great tools online, uh, apps and online resources, where you can look at multiple versions in columns all at once. So if you pick a passage and say, I want to see this in the ESV and the NIV and in the message, they'll line those all up for you. So it's really easy to compare across translations uh, and start to see how they vary and what different insights the different translations offer. So I want to close out by recommending a book, uh, and this is a book actually uh, we had for our hermeneutics class. It's called How to Choose a Translation for All It's Worth, and it's written by Gordon Fee, F-E-E, and Mark Strauss, S-T-R-A-U-S-S, and I will link to that in that blog post as well. And that does a really, really good job. If you want to get further into this, that book does an excellent job of breaking down not only the different translations, but the spectrum, why the translations are different in the ways that they're different. Uh, and it just goes a lot deeper into a lot of these topics that I've discussed here today. So that's going to wrap it up. Uh, hopefully that brings you a little bit of insight to why there are so many different translations and how best to go about using all the different translations. Again, any questions, thoughts, or responses, feel free. UnlikelySeminarian at gmail.com. Shoot me an email. I love hearing from you all, and I thank you once again for listening. My name is Dan Cook, and you've been listening to The Unlikely Seminarian.